Greetings and welcome to Classical Reflections. Some of you may know me or recognize my voice as Magisterkraft. Others still may recognize me as Julius um, from Legio Tertia Decima with my friend uh, Luca Modeus Ranieri. But I come to you all today as uh, Jesse Kraft uh, in, in this, I don't know, this new possible endeavor. I, um, like many of you, no doubt, have so many interests besides the ones that I show to you on a regular basis. And I often feel the need to express myself, not just for personal reasons, although that, that does take, uh, does play a role in this uh, desire to, uh, to create this, but, um, also because I feel that sometimes some of the things that I um, have to say or that other people have to say could in some way benefit someone else. And that as, as it is my role, I feel to help others in these ways and that I'm able, I feel that in keeping this information and in withholding this information, I'm not doing my part in society. Um, yes, I'm a teacher, and so I, I play a, a, a crucial role in the development uh, of, uh, of our people, uh, of, of humanity, but uh, I feel that I could, I could possibly do a bit more. I don't know how um, sustainable this project is. Um, I have uh, currently an episode and a uh, recorded and a few other that I wish to uh, to do and then eventually to present to you all. Um, if the project should uh, take flight and prove to be beneficial to to many of you and that it should be doable by myself and that it might be interesting and insightful and so on and if that should be the case, I'm I'm happy to uh, to continue to pursue this. As I said before, as you all well know, uh, busy with uh, so many things, as no doubt you all are. But I thought, at least for now, I will uh, I will start this uh, this little podcast and present to you a, a few things um, which I have found to be interesting um, and insightful. I'll tell you um, now, I suppose, where some of my interests lie. I guess in that way it could help you to determine if this is something that could be of interest to you or not. I I suppose I I like a little bit of everything, um, but particularly uh, philosophy is something which is of interest to me. I I won't say that I'm a philosopher insofar as that, that is my that I am a philosopher. I couldn't describe myself as, as that, although I, I do like philosophy. I do like to philosophize, let's say, about things, you know, think critically and deeply about them. And mm, I suppose you could say I'm a, a would-be philosopher. I, I would like to be, um, if time permitted, right? But um, so that that's something of interest to me. Of course, languages uh, in general are uh, are of great interest to me. Besides the languages that I speak, uh, just generally interested in in languages and in language development. And that's going to play a role in, and of course, the uh, some of the choices of uh, uh, discussion and conversations that I have with uh, with others. Um, life in general, right? Nature. I guess, humanity. I suppose we could just sort of sum it all up and say, I just in general really like humanity. So if something should fall under the sphere of humanity, I, I know that's a catch-all and it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a way out, I suppose, of, of, of answering. Uh, well, at least you might think that, although um, I might, uh, I would disagree with you and say that um, it's just being a, uh, uh, practical and saying that humanity truthfully is something that I'm interested in and that includes um, as I'm thinking now probably all aspects of it so all that to say that you could probably anticipate me 
discussing quite literally anything on here uh, on this podcast. I intend to do it in English, though. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't think Latin is the language that I will use for this. I, I do that with Legio Tertia Decima with my dear friend uh, Lucas uh, Luca Ranieri. And I speak Latin in my uh, Magister Craft productions, but um, no, no, I think here English would be the uh, the better language to use. Now that will, of course, alienate some of you, and I do apologize if uh, English is not a language that you speak. And um, it's sort of, you might say, also silly of me to to be apologizing to those people if they can't understand me. But um, again, I think there is where we might part. In our understanding of what it means to uh, to apologize for something, and in which case, though I I do regret that these folks aren't um, aren't able to uh, to understand what I uh, what I might have to say, and of course that's all based on a presupposition that that anything that I have to say might be of any value or worth, and and for all I know it may be of no worth and no value to anyone. I think someone will get something out of it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this currently. But at any rate, though, um, whether you like it or not, uh, whether you're able to hear it or not, um, I present it to you and hope that uh, at least my sincerest, um, my my intentions, my my drive, my my motivations. Are, uh, are at least seen and respected and appreciated. So without further delay, I would like to present you all with the uh, first episode of the uh, Classical Reflections podcast. In my first episode of Classical Reflections, I am visited with uh, a former professor um, and now friend and colleague, uh, David Wharton. Uh, Dr. Wharton is a, uh, an associate professor at the Department of Classical Studies at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, Dr. Wharton um, has, a, uh, has a bachelor's in, uh, in history and Greek from Cornell College, a master's in ancient Greek uh, from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and then he received his Ph.D. in classical philology uh, from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in uh, 1992. Um, he has taught at Chapel Hill. Uh, he taught there for about four years. And then in 1989 until present, um, he has been uh, teaching and, and educating and and broadening the minds and having great conversations with the with the young folks at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, Dr. Wharton um, has uh, research interests in um, in the light that uh, linguistics can shed on the study of Latin literature. Um, his uh, recent research has focused on the lexical semantics of the Latin language. He currently has a book project called Latin Color in Context, a uh, reassessment of the Latin color vocabulary in light of recent linguistic and anthropological research on color terms across the world's languages. He has some, uh, some publications that I will mention here, although a, a full CV of his can be found um, by searching his name, David Wharton, at uh, UNCG. Um, he's published uh, Linguistic Semantics and the Representation of Word Meanings in Latin Dictionaries. That was in uh, Formal Linguistics and the Teaching of Latin um, through uh, Cambridge Scholars. Uh, it's a 2011 publication. Also, um, on the distribution of abnominal prepositional phrases in Latin prose, that was with Classical Philology, uh, 2009. And uh, Sunt Lacrimae Rerum, a linguistic exploration with the classical journal in 2008. In my conversation with uh, Dr. Wharton, with David Wharton, we will start off 
um, well, it was the intention, I shouldn't say anyways, to, to sort of just kind of have a conversation about color. What is, what is color? What is its, how is it represented in language? With the, with the focus, I suppose, initially on the classical languages, Greek and Latin, and, and maybe with even a, a greater emphasis towards Latin, although Greek is certainly important to help us understand that. Understand the understand the the way that these language uh, these terms came to be in Latin, uh, but but even even in our own language, we will talk a, a little bit about uh, color terms in English. Um, Dr. Wharton will uh, will give us uh, some insight into uh, a little bit of of Russian and 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 and, and how to uh, just in general of, of colors how to how to view them and and how the ancients viewed them. And he'll give us, we'll discuss a little bit of um, some sort of advice, right, in terms of how do we as, as language teachers use these color terms? Where should we go about getting these terms? Where do we find them? Who are some good sources for that? And when we when we find, which no doubt and, and in, inevitably we will encounter, when we find the myriad uh, forms of different types of terms and how do we process that information and determine which of those terms will be best suited for our present needs, right? We'll address uh, these matters uh, and more coupled with, uh, coupled with some laughs and some reminiscences of, uh, of, of, times, uh, of times past. So um, without further delay, um, I bring to you uh, Dr. David Wharton. Okay, so um, I'm here with uh, David uh, Wharton. Uh, David, uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Um, thanks for having me. Um, before I before we get into this, I, I wanted to uh, just be sort of forthcoming with everyone. Uh, you are a former professor of mine um, at the uh, University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, one of my, I had some of the, uh, some of my best times, uh, there, uh, don't mind sharing just briefly. Uh, I think, what was the class of uh, ancient cosmology? Yeah. Not cosmetology, right? No, no. Although we did have one student that, that signed up for that and, and left after the first day when she realized it wasn't ancient cosmetology. <laughs> yeah, definitely not, uh, ancient cosmetology. Um, uh, that was, uh, that was an excellent class. Uh, then you, then you did a, a Poetry in the Age of Augustus, right? Um, yeah, we did uh, memorably the Ars Amatoria, yeah. which was uh, which was awesome. Lots of I still I still teach teach that in my uh, in my high school classes. Have lots of fun with that. Uh, that was a great class. You, that yeah. was one of my favorite all time favorite classes. You all were fantastic. Oh, awesome! Uh, and then uh, of course, like the uh, the oral Latin the the class that we did the. Uh, composition latin class that was fantastic fantastic um and i think uh historical linguistics yeah it was a few years back but uh but also just a an eye-opening course um so as i uh, uh will have mentioned in the uh, in the intro there um some of the uh some of your um areas of expertise um i just wondered if you could you know kind of maybe describe for us the process of going from you know having interest in philosophy uh, poetry, linguistics, and and then how is it that you find yourself um, later uh, interested in in colors and antiquity? Well, uh, that's a great question. I, as to the philosophy, you know, I don't I don't do real research on that. I you know I teach some um, kind of intro with the cosmology class. You know, mm -hmm. that's an undergraduate class, and that's that's fun to teach because I was interested in 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 uh, basically Greek science when I was in grad school and I did a, a special field with that under Professor Peter Smith but it's not something I've ever published in when I when I get started my dissertation work I got more interested in linguistics because I was studying uh, w uh, with uh, Professor Lawrence Stevens who's a very good he's still is a fantastic linguist and got me interested in the linguistic side of things and I you know I've continued to pursue that so <clears throat> Oh, you know, I got interested in lexical semantics and word meanings, 
and uh, I, you know, have written a little bit about um, ancient diction, uh, modern historical dictionaries of ancient languages, and that got me more specifically into the pro problems of why do, you, basically, why do even really good dictionaries stink when they're trying to tell you how color <laughs> words work in an ancient language? You know, because those lexicographers are fantastic; they do they do great work, but they. You, you get some kind of baffling, sometimes contradictory information in dictionaries about about words. So I got actually got interested in the word for blue, and that that's what um, Chirulius in Latin, and that's mm. what got me going. You know, you pull on a thread, and the whole thing, the whole fa the whole garment comes unraveling, and that's kind of that's kind of how I got here. Ah, uh, you know the. Uh... When, when you had, um, I guess it was some years ago, I guess maybe I was, I had already uh, graduated school when you, or maybe maybe it was the, that last year when you had started um, working on, uh, I think, a, a book uh, or a book chapter on, on color. Um, and I remember uh, thinking about colors and it, it reminded me of these sort of, um, these sort of like spooky uh, college uh, discussions that I would have uh, occasionally with these sort of like budding or, you know, like a would be philosophers uh, uh, who would say, uh, you know, these are these are college kids at parties and stuff, you know, who would say that, you know, color is a, is just a pigment of your imagination, you know, that, <laughs> <laughs> that whole um, <laughs> silly stuff. But but you know, yeah, at yeah. the same time, it was kind of it was kind of uh, not far off. I thought I'm, I mean, is, is isn't that kind of what color? Uh, well, color it is still is? kind of. I mean, th there are a lot of mysterious things about color. We don't actually. I mean, we know a lot of things about what causes us to have color sensations, right? So mm -hmm. we we know it has to do with light and and has stuff to do with light waves, even though it, the the relationship between the, the perceived colors in our minds and and light waves is actually is not as simple as most people think. Mm -hmm. But I mean, one thing we don't know is, you know, we so we know we know about light and we know something about the physiology and um, neurology of the of the eye and the optic nerve but we have no idea essentially why with all that going on the color sensations that come into our mind the basic sensations where they come from are really because um, mm. we, we, we don't actually understand why we have minds at all <laughs> right, which, <laughs> right which is which is another <laughs> right I, I mean so it goes into the whole the whole problem of subjective experience which yes. no one has yet explained it's one of the big mysteries of the world why you know why do we have consciousness and and how does it arise from the brain or is it is it something uh, in addition to the brain i mean philosophers are still arguing about those and color is bound bound up with that so um in, in all of that, though, could there be a uh, perhaps sort of a, a more basic just kind of uh, running definition of color that we could maybe start with? Uh, you know, what would what was what was something basic but satisfactory be for you if you just had to kind of quickly get the word color out there so we could help people along? I mean, in, so, in some situations, I like to talk of it simply as a sensation mm -hmm. because, you know, as, as a per, per, completely subjective experience we, yes. you know, we have these sensations and we un we know from optical illusions and stuff that oftentimes our sensations don't don't line up with what's in the world they, they're usually some relationship with yes. us, but they're not always um, but I think you know and I'm not I'm not a philosopher on this but I think philosophers would call color basically a lot of them call it a secondary quality of things a lot mm -hmm. of people don't think it's a quality of things at all mm -hmm. so they're not ag agreed but uh, let's just say it it is a it is a quality it's a perceived quality of things that has some relationship to the way uh, uh, that objects in the world reflect light it's not a primary quality like mass okay the mass yes. of something is unchangeable whether you can see it or not whereas a secondary quality is a is a, is a perceived quality with, that doesn't quite inhere in in a body like the, the way that its mass or its its magnitude does I see okay well, so um, is there is there anything in the uh, maybe the uh, the etymology of the term of the word color itself that could maybe help us understand? I don't know, sort of how the ancients thought of this. Uh, I mean, we uh, our listeners, of course, will be will know that the word color is itself a, a Latin word, but does it does it come from anything in particular or any other word? So, I mean, it has the Latin word, you know. 
Well, different languages have different words for it. In fact, there are some languages that actually don't have a word for color that mm. for that that category of qualities that um, that, that we say. And that, that's why some semanticists like Anna Wiersbeke says, you know, color isn't even a universal concept because some languages don't have they don't have color words or they don't have a word for color. But in Greek, the word is chroma, yeah. well, which is actually related to the Greek word kros for skin. Okay, which mm. means surface. Okay. Yes. Um, and so you know, uh, as the Greeks and others were, you know, developing their concept of c- color as a quality of things, obviously has to do with the the surfaces of, you know, it's a, it's a surface quality of things. Um, for Latin, you know, the Latin word color it sometimes is used to mean something pretty close to what we mean when we say. You know, I'm I'm looking at the color of your shirt and it's blue. But they have other uses of it, like in rhetoric. You know, we need to talk about colores in in rhetoric. That's kind of that's their word for uh, the the spin that you know uh, an orator would put on an argument. Um, and sometimes it has a broader meaning, just like the the appearance of of, of something. So, but it, the word color also in English has a lot of different senses as well. But I don't, you don't think, yeah, etymology, um, not, I don't think it's going to help us understand, partic- well, it, it does understand some, some things about the way the Romans thought about this. In, um, so if you want to read about the various uses of the word color, I think Mark Bradley's book, um, which is uh, Color and Meaning in Ancient Rome, is really the best thing to read on that. I asked because I'd in preparing to uh, to talk with you, I just kind of went through a few things here and there that I could uh, that I could sort of gather um, uh, and uh, and came across something about um, some uh, some discussion that the, the the word color may have come from a uh, from I don't I don't know necessarily if it was a Latin term or not, but uh, that had a root which meant to uh, to cover or to uh, to conceal or something, and so I didn't know. If there was, uh, if if I'd misread something, no, no, or if there was something I, more to that, no, or... I haven't, you know, I haven't done, you know, I haven't looked at the etymology of the development of that term mm. itself. But mm-hmm. That, you know, it certainly that makes perfectly good sense to me. If it again, if it's a covering or the surface of something, that that lines up with the way the Greeks were, and probably others were thinking it as well. Yeah, well, so you've, um, I mean, you've studied uh, color. And more than just um, just Latin, but um, I mean, I guess you've you've looked at it just across languages in, in general, right? Um, is there a, I don't know, perhaps a uh, maybe a particular way that well, maybe we could start with English, if you if if you uh, are okay with that sort of how why, how do we as English speakers kind of maybe give give colors their 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 names? Is there a, <laughs> is there a rhyme or reason to that, or or is it? Because it seems sort of abstract, doesn't it? Some of the so, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of th- so there there are um, a bunch of competing theories out there about about color naming and how that happens and whether and whether that's just a process that each culture and each language does on its own completely idiosyncratically or whether there are some universals of color perception and color naming. Okay, mm-hmm. and this was um, a question. Um, so if you um, so let's let's go back to the beginning of the study of color in ancient languages. Yeah. Um, w- William Gladstone, in the eighteen I think eighteen fifties eighteen sixties, he was a British prime minister, but also a Homer scholar, and he yeah now he was. And, <laughs> and he's a good scholar, um, yes. you know, for someone who's also you know running the the, the British government, but. Um, <laughs> He wrote a book called uh, Studies on Homer in the Homeric Age, and he had a whole, he had a whole chapter on Homer's color words. And he's one of the first people to notice that the words in Greek that Homer uses for color are very, very different in the way they're used from English. For one thing, he says they have a lot fewer words. Uh, Homer has a lot fewer words. And also, you know, the, the color words that he uses did not um, line up with what what our English uses. So, you know, he's got a word, uh, kuaneos, you know, which people would like to translate as being blue, but it some it means black sometimes, or dark, or shiny, or metallic. It doesn't seem to have the same kind of color meaning uh, for us. Uh, you know, and he talks about the word uh, chloris, chloris, 
you know, which translators had tried to translate yellow or green, but it, it, it seems to mean both, either or both of those things. And also, it seems to mean also fresh or living or moist. So, and, and then, um, and then there's, there's a bunch of areas in the, you know, that, of the English vocabulary that there just didn't seem to be any any Greek words for. So he was the first person to notice that the that the color terms of one language, like Greek, don't really map well onto their meanings in English. Okay? So there, you know, uh, uh, we think we have, you know, so I'm, I'm looking at your blue shirt there. We have a, in English, we have a pretty well-defined concept of what blue is and what blue isn't, all right? And we think blue, oh, it's one of the colors, right? It's, and, and so every language should have a word for blue because blue is, we think it's a natural color category, right? Just, just in a way that, like, like there's a difference between dogs and cats. There's a difference between blue and green, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, but there isn't, okay? Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, if you, if you look at uh, a color spectrum, mm -hmm. you realize it's a, color is a scalar phenomenon, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so like if you go to the Lowe's, you go to the paint store, and you look at all the color chips there. They kind of arrange them in a scalar way, so that the, the transitions are natural. But it's like when they go from the blues to the greens, there's a there's a lot of area in there where you'd say, well, that's kind of green, but that's more blue. It's got some blue in it. It's not, you know. And then it gets then you get to some blue, and you go, that blue, that's the bluest blue I can think of, right? Which is right. really different from the greenest green you can think of. But then there's a bunch of colors in there that are kind of sort of in between. Um, so, so yeah. So the the question is. Uh, we have our our names for like basic color words, and there's there's eleven of them in English, like black, white, gray, red, um, y orange, yellow. That's five. Um, uh, pink. We got blue, green, purple. Uh, what am I missing? Uh, brown. Uh, uh, I'm missing one. Okay, those are our what we call our sort of basic color categories. Okay. Okay. And any other color that you could name would probably fit into a subcategory of one of those 11 basic color terms. Yeah. Right? Okay. So we you know, like scarlet and crimson and whatever. They're all kinds of reds, right? Sure. Okay. So English and most modern languages have uh, 11 of these words. Russian actually has 12. Russian subdivides two blue into two separate blues that they think they... They don't think they're the same color. Okay, we would say, well, there's Duke blue and there's Carolina blue. They're both blue, right? They're the same, right. they, same category, but they have, I think it's Sini and Globjoy. Glob, I, I, I'm not a Russianist yet. Yes. They think of these completely se separate color categories and they don't overlap. Interesting. So for them, there's no, there is no continuum, no scaling between the. Well, there's scaling, those. I mean, in the sense that we can say, you know, you know, Carolina blue is a lighter blue and Duke blue is a darker blue, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're scaling there, but we don't. We don't. Uh, we we think that blue and green belong to separate categories, right? Right. Right. But, but for them, um, but but the blues, the blues of Duke blue and Carolina blue, both belong to one category, which is blue, right? Yes. But for them, Sini and this other other word are separate categories. So they would say, you know, that that Carolina blue doesn't belong to the same category as deep, as Duke blue. Actually, Interesting. Okay, but anyhow, so the the question is, um, and th this was studied by a couple of scholars named Berlin and Kay in a book called Basic Color Terms uh, uh, that came out in 1969. It caused a huge controversy. Okay, because previous to that, especially the, in the anthropology community, people thought that all um, languages. Uh, they sort of divided up their color categories any way that they wanted, whatever was a useful way to their culture. Okay, just just like Gladstone saw that the Greeks had a completely different system of categorization, um, so they thought it was they call this sort of color relativism. Each culture has its own way of thinking about colors and dividing it up into different categories. And in fact, um, you notice that in, in a lot of cultures. Their color terms often include other qualities than what we would call color. 
Okay. Okay. For for instance, do uh, you, you mean like a for instance, this like, like the a Greek smell word. or something? Yeah, or, or moistness, like in chloris, this word for greenish yellow. Okay, it, it's used usually for living things yeah, that that are moist and not dried out. And there are uh, there are other languages do, that do that. Although I think he didn't notice at the time that actually the English word green does the same thing. <laughs> that is. <laughs> We can use it as a pure, sort of a pure color term if we want. I say, well, you're, I've got a green sports car. Um, right. But you can also say, well, I've got some firewood, but it's not ready to be burned yet because it's still kind of green, right? It's still kind of green, yes. Yeah, uh-huh. Which means it's moist, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, so even even modern color terms can have more than one more than a color idea in them. Or, or can't you say of a, say of a person who is... Um sort of a novice, you could say that that person is still, uh, don't we say that that person is still green? He's um, pretty green, yeah, which means they're young, right, f- yeah, sort of fresh. Yeah. So, uh, anyhow, getting back to this idea, that, so there's a big debate among um, universalists, you know, who, uh, mostly Americans of a sort of cognitive science bent, think that um, these basic color terms that I mentioned in English, um, they're not universal in that all languages have them, okay. but they think they are universal and that they think as languages develop more and more color terms, they tend to hit, their, their basic color terms tend to be the same ones that we have and, and, the, um, and the best examples of each of those colors then tend to line up from culture to culture. So if you look at color terms in modern French or German or Spanish, their basic terms, uh, uh, they have a, the same number of basic terms, and they, they basically, those words represent pretty much the same color. So that is, they do map pretty well. Okay. So would, would, these, um, would these folks perhaps argue that there's some sort of a correlation between the, um, uh, perhaps maybe the, the poverty, uh, maybe poverty is not, not necessarily the right word, but... So, um, you know, maybe if, uh, if, if we determine that this language, this particular language that we're studying doesn't have as many terms as, say, you know, English or, you know, one of the modern languages, um, are they saying that, that that sort of poverty in terminology for colors is indicative and correlative to maybe it's, it's being an underdeveloped language so that, you know, the, the more developed the language becomes, the more color terms they develop, or is there no true relationship between those? So they're very careful in the way they talk about this, okay? Mm-hmm. But um, what they ask, so I, and I'll tell you, they studied this very idea that you've stated very well, is whether languages develop more color terms, more basic color terms over time. Mm-hmm. And they talk about this in terms of evolution, all right? They call it, you know, the evolution of color terms. And what they did in order to test this is they sent out um, people with these little sets of color chips from the Munsell Color Company, okay, okay. In, a, in, a, in a questionnaire, uh-huh. okay? And, uh, and what they did, they asked people from cultures all over the world, and a lot of the people who were doing this were actually missionaries who okay. were... Um, um, who are who are going to these places, you know, to sp- spread the gospel, right? But they all, the, but the, um, the folks, Berlin and Kay and their folks who are said, by the way, would you take along this set of color chips while you're out there and ask these people this set of questions about I, about naming colors? <laughs> so, so they're they're knocking on these huts and saying, um, has anyone talked to you about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? And by the way, does this look <laughs> blue or green to you? That's is pr- kind of that's pretty. <laughs> I, so, I don't. We don't know anything about about. Um, not all of them were mis- missionaries, but missionaries were convenient people because they're the ones who were going out and talking to people in all these you know, all these far flung parts of the world. Um, so, um, and it was a it was a, They had a, a, the same set of standardized chips and in a, in a, the same set of questions that they would ask them about categorizing their colors. And was, this is part of a multi year project called the World Color Survey. Um, and and uh, all the results are online. Uh, if you just t- t- type up World Color Survey, you can find it. It's all in uh, 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 
it's it's all there, and they published a nice book. Uh, I think it's two thousand and nine, uh, in, in in which you can see it. So here's what they think they found out, yeah. which is that yeah, the the number of basic color terms you have de definitely seems to be related to the amount of technology in your in your culture. Your yeah, and so as cultures get more complex technologically, they tend to acquire more basic terms. And what they found was that. Um, um, so uh, cultures that didn't have a lot of the techno lot technology were pre were not you know non non literate. They often for their basic terms they might have only three, maybe even just two terms, which you know we would say that you know they call them a white or a black term, but but, but their white doesn't mean what it means in English. It means uh, pretty much w the light part. The, the 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 light and warm part of the visible spectrum all right and their and their black word their dark word basically was the was the was the dark and cool cool part of the spectrum so that so their their word for black would include stuff we would call black gray blue dark blue dark green dark purple dark red anything that was dark would be you know black for them and in in the, in the brighter words that you know like white you know light gray yellow um, you know, light red, pink, or whatever would be their white term, and that what what happens is, Berlin and Kay thinks that la as languages develop more basic terms, they do it in a very specific order. It doesn't just happen at random, and um, uh, so they. And it, 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 it turns out there's the, there are a few possible orders in which this happens. Okay, but basically, you know, in in. Um, uh, in the end, what you end up with is a country, uh, comp uh, a language that's got, uh, you know, 11, or in the case of Russian, maybe even 12 of these basic terms. That doesn't mean they don't have a ton of other color terms, okay? Just like English, I mean, we've got hundreds of different color words. Yeah, seafoam green comes to mind. Right. Like and there are people that whose whose job is making up names for them, like for the Pantone Color Company or whatever. Crayola. <laughs> right. And, uh, and there are, you know, there are all kinds of, you know, we can say you're looking kind of ashy, you know, right. or you're, yes. we use um, using words metonymically from material things. It's all, languages do this all, all the time. So, you know, it's, uh, um, anyhow, I, I should say this is their theory, uh, the, the sort of universal evolution theory. Um, is pretty popular among American cognitive scientists, whatever. I gotta say, um, in, in Europe and for people on the humanities side of things, they tend to hate this theory and they say it's all a bunch of crap. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and the reason they say it's a bunch of crap is they, they, because they think the way that they gathered the data com completely um, guarantees that they're gonna get a certain result and it doesn't really tell you what people actually think. Now, I mean, if, you, if you're if you're talking to some folks who are living in a Brazilian rainforest, you know their yeah. culture has been there, and you're showing them these these color chips, which they've never seen before, anything like this. You're basically forcing them to answer questions that are going to fit into your paradigm. You're not asking them what they really think about color. Okay, yeah. so you're missing a ton of data. So it's very controversial. And you know um, another thing that that might. St uh be a little controversial and might might have gone against that it was i was kind of getting the sense that um it, it seemed like this um so they were saying that they were essentially just black and white right and and i and i seem to recall reading somewhere about um uh ancient peoples at least this was a thought that they may have been uh, colorblind or something is that uh what what's what what's that about? Uh, can you kind of shed some light or some color on I can, that? I can, and it's going to go back to Gladstone again because his name turns up. You know, I, I heard there's something. Uh, there's a uh, who are those science dudes on NPR? What's um, uh, Radio Lab? Okay, there's a Radio Lab about this, and they start talking about Gladstone, and and Gladstone himself tried to understand why the Greeks distinguished their color naming was so odd to him. And he, if you don't read him very carefully, okay, you're going to think that he said the Greeks were colorblind, okay? And that they, but that's not what he said, <laughs> okay? Because um, to us, colorblindness means that you actually cannot, say, see the difference 
right. between red and blue. That, 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 that there's no, you can't notice that difference. And that couldn't be because of physiological reasons. You know, I have friends who have red-green color blindness. And um, I have a good friend, actually, I saw a video of him on YouTube. You can get glasses now that adjust vision. Have you seen these um, colorblind glasses? It's No, not the, not the colorblind. I've seen the others that claim to give sight to the blind. But well, I'm no, you can it. actually buy uh, glasses that, that somehow allow people who are, have certain kinds of colorblinds to perceive the differences in colors that they couldn't see before. Oh, could you imagine the first time? Oh, man. Well, I saw my friend Bruce. I didn't even know he was colorblind, but his family bought him these glasses. They're quite expensive. And he put them on. You know, he was outside looking at the beach, and he was just like, oh, man. He said, you know, suddenly he could distinguish all these, you know, the, the colors seemed so much brighter to him, and he could see the pinks and the oranges and the reds. He couldn't distinguish them before. He's so happy about it. Okay, so that's wow. a that's a physiological thing that we can we can do. I'll tell you what um, what Gladstone said was, he said um, he thought that the ability uh, 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 to distinguish colors okay, in language was something you acquired over time. Okay, yes. that um, that it's something that you learn. Okay. And he thought that the Greeks had not yet learned how to do that. And the analogy that he used was, if you are studying painting, okay, if you go to if you go to art school, if you're just you're just a a bloke like me, you know, I was like, I don't have this really super refined ability to name and distinguish various kinds of blue, right, from cobalt right. blue, from Prussian blue, or whatever. But if you go to art school, right. And you study color, you're going to you're going to acquire that skill. Okay, so your your ability to consciously distinguish between different different colors is going to be something that you can you can acquire over time. And, and Gladstone thought that the the Greeks simply didn't care that much about hue. Okay, okay. we we really care about hue. It, he thought the Greeks actually really cared about brightness and darkness. That that mattered to them a lot more. And it's not that they couldn't say see the difference between a green hue and a blue hue. Yes. They just didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay? They just, it just didn't matter to them. Okay. Let me use a musical analogy. Yeah. Um, are you, so, um, uh, can you, uh, I was, I was going to say, so I listen to Gregorian chant, all right? And there are like there are like nine different modes. They're like scales of Gregorian's chant, right? When I now when I when I listen to it, I'm not, um I I can say like, wow, that one sounds a little bit different from the other one, but I really can't tell, you know, I really can't tell you why and I can't tell you which mode it is, but I can sort of hear it. Okay. That means I I can, I can hear that it's different, but I can't name it or tell you exactly why it is. Sure. So he's thinking that same thing is about for the ancients about color. Um, and how do you how do you feel about being able to distinguish between those modes? Do you care, or do you just say, you know what, I I appreciate the music for what it is, and I really don't care to tell you whether it's this mode or that mode. Do um, you consider yourself a Greek in this in this regard? I, I, I am, I am. Although I start, <laughs> I start, but, but I've recently started trying to learn to sing them, and then I, and then, then ah. it matters. So as you as you acquire the skill, I'm not very good at it, by the way. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you get it. You get a sense for it as it's going on. You say, oh, that's the Mixolydian mode. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you to give uh, give us a sample, but maybe maybe we no, won't. You said you're not very good at that. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so um, uh, so actually, Gladstone's idea that cultures acquire the disposition to distinguish colors more carefully as they go through time, sort of is conf confirmed by these evolutionary uh, universalists. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that there was a uh, I've got a there's a color kind of what well, do you do you call it a color or just sort of like a description. Those kind of floating around um, from, uh, I think it was in the uh, the Iliad, right? That was um, Homer had described the sea as being um, oinops. Ah, there it is, like having that wine face. What? First of all, whatever wine face means. I mean, I get the wine part, but does the face does that just mean like the surface? It's like a 
it's a surface color and then and and what, what what's kind of behind the thought process of saying wine face C can you kind of <laughs> <laughs> I wish we knew it, it so there are a lot of theories out there uh, uh, but it, clearly it's not really hue right because the I mean ocean mm-hmm. although the ocean can at certain times of the day take a sort of whiny hue you know sort of purplish in certain kinds of light but normally it doesn't so it's clearly he's not clearly thinking of the hue of wine okay right um, what what people think uh, and, and I think these are good thoughts. I tend to agree with them. First of all, that wine is shiny, right? It's mm-hmm. it's reflective, and it yeah. has a it has a certain amount of color saturation to it. Dark uh-huh. wine. Um, so he's probably he's probably paying attention to sheen and saturation, right? Um, uh, and that that's you know our best guess guess is what he's getting at that that he cares about shininess because they like brightness and it's, you know when I talk about saturation or depth of hue right you, yeah. if you look at an ocean you know sometimes it's grayish sometimes it's green sometimes it's blue but it's sort of semi-opaque in the way that a wine is as well right and, and it's got about the same amount of um, color saturation very often as as a glass of wine that some light passes through it but not entirely so I, that a lot of other scholars have thought that that's what he means by it and i think that makes sense so in in his case uh he's sort of drawing off of his own personal experience of well he's no doubt witnessed wine maybe spilled uh, on a table or floor or whatever numerous times and and in that particular moment he's sort of looking out at the sea and and that's just the sort of the first thing that comes to mind, like, wow, that really looks like this wine that I've seen and you know, and think, it has all the same qualities yeah. that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, I think so. Okay. You know, he's, assuming he wasn't actually blind and there was a homer. Right. right. Sure. Yes. You know, his, I'm going to imagine his experience of wine would have been in, um, you know, in a drinking cup of some kind or in a crosshair mm. where it's being mixed. So you can see, yeah. you can sort of see through it, you know, mm-hmm. and it's got, it's got some color, uh, color to it it would you know would have been mixed with water so it would be you know pretty translucent yes and i think the seas in you know it's on a shiny day it's the surface of it is reflecting light just like the the ocean you look into the ocean it it does those same things you know the thing that freaks us out is like why he doesn't care about the hue right how can he be ignoring hue and uh it's like nah the greeks don't they're just not that into hue yeah. I mean, well, let's say say this: there are artists. Yeah. It, when, when when you look at Greek ancient Greek art, okay, yes, mm-hmm. you you look at Minoan and Mycenaean painting and whatever, they certainly were able to distinguish colors, and they were very skilled with their pigments. So they were able to tell the difference, fine gradations of hue when they felt like it. And I'm gonna bet that the that the artists themselves had a very sophisticated color vocabulary dealing with their the colors of their pigments and where they were dealing with traders and trying to get just the right color. They probably had a very a very good technical color vocabulary. Just like the people at the Pantone Color Company right. <laughs> have a very highly sophisticated technical color vocabulary, which I don't have. Yes. But Homer yeah, but the average person like Homer is not that interested in those things. Well so these are the these are the ancient Greeks and, and I wonder um, you know with with Hellenism being what it is, but then also just uh, the Romans being in, in close vicinity to the Greeks and having no doubt similar experiences and and similar um, you know linguistic origins and and things. Do they do we see sort of the same patterns in uh, in Latin? Yeah. So um, you know, one of the things I was interested in finding out when I started reading about this idea of universal color revolution was whether or not the Romans had, you know, whether they had evolved basic color terms um, similar similar to ours. It, there's a basic methodological problem, though, in that we can't travel back in time and show the Romans a bunch of these color chips and say, what do you call <laughs> yeah. this? What do you call this? It would be great yeah. if we can. So we have to try to figure out what they were thinking by reading their texts and seeing the way they use color words. And that's, a, that's actually a very different way of, way of talking about color and so we can't it's very hard to get good data about that um latin too is you know it, 
sucks up a lot of words from other languages. You know, it, Latin likes to get, um, likes to do a lot of linguistic borrowing. So by the time Latin emerges to us, it's already been around as a language for a long time, yeah. and it's already been absorbing bits of Greek and Etruscan and various other Italic, you know, uh, stuff for a long time. So you know, by uh, by the time of our earliest Latin, you know, like Cato the Elder's De Agricultura, Latin already has a very well developed color vocabulary, and um, uh, uh, so you know it it. It has a whole lot of very specific terms. Um, the problem is it's got lots of synonyms, which is kind of, it's not super unusual, but it's got, you know, for white, it's got albus, and it's got can, uh, candidus. For black, it's got niger, and it's got ater. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a bunch of red terms, right? Right, <laughs> there's, yeah. There's uh, rubere. But actually, they, the Romans prefer to use a verb for, for things being red. They use, you know, rubeo, rubere. Uh, uh, instead of saying uh, you know this thing est is rubere, they say rubet. It's it's redding. <laughs> it's redding. Yes, it's so... being red. It's being red, right? Uh, you know, but they they have other words. You know, they have got uh, rusus and um, you know rubicundus and a bunch of other red words. And then the weird thing is they don't um, they don't seem to have uh, a word that lines up directly with our concept of yellow. Well, they what was what's the color? flowers or something? Flowers, yeah, right? Flowers, yeah. But that flowers actually is mostly used of hair. Okay, mm. it's, so it's more like the word blonde. Okay, so it does refer to yellow hair and also to yellow grain. And there's the verb flawesco, flawescera, to become yellow, which is often used of grain turning yellow or you know plants turning yellow. But um, you know they don't. It doesn't, you know, there are some, some color terms like in English that only are applied to specific things. You can't, you know, I can't say you're wearing a blonde jacket. <laughs> right. <laughs> or give me that, that, you know, we have colored paper. Give me that blonde piece of paper. I mean, it's, not, right. it's just got to go with hair. And there's a bunch of, yes. you know, there's a bunch of, especially for animal color terms, like there's roan for horses and brindle and uh, stuff like that. So flowers is probably a, a term more like that. Then um, you know, they have another word, luteus, right? Okay. Which is used very often to describe the color of an egg yolk in Pliny the Elder. In fact, they call oh. they call an egg yolk the luteum of the egg. Okay. Right? There's the ah. there's the album and there's the luteum. There's the white and the luteum. But it also things things that are pink or even orange also get described as luteum. So that's clearly a different color category from yellow. It in, it includes some of what we would call yellow, but also some orangey and pinky thing so if you think of you like your color spectrum mm -hmm. you know those colors are all kind of contiguous together right yeah so with that you said luteum luteum luteus yeah luteus luteus so when they when do you think when they're using that color uh, excuse me that term um are they saying that something is like an egg yolk no no in, good's a great question um, but actually, the word is der derived from uh, the name of it's originally the name of a dye from a plant. Uh -huh. um, uh, so it's a it's a it's a dye name that then becomes a more abstract color color term. But it's the color that um, uh, that you know. So it's color associated with women and brides. Mm -hmm. Okay, they would have worn a, a bridal veil called a flamium, right? Mm -hmm. which is often also described as having this color luteus and so it's it again it's uh, it it refers to a range of color from yellow to yellow orange or you know to reddish yellow even into pinkish yellow so think of it think of it as occupying a certain territory as opposed to referring to one really specific hue so in this case, then, um, it looks like Latin has some more abstract terms, sort of like what we're used to then in, in English, right? So yellow doesn't necessarily refer to a particular object. It's just, it's more of a, a color, right? A, a, 
Whereas it seems like that Ludius is, is doing something similar. Is yeah. that what you're saying? Then? Yeah, this is sort of, sort of a matter of some controversy, and this is where I, mm. I'm, I'm disagreeing with this with a really good scholar, Mark Bradley. Again, his book, Color and Meaning in Ancient Rome, it's a, it's a fantastic book full of really great stuff. But he does have a sort of, one of his central themes is that the Romans did not have abstract color ideas. Okay, so we can sort of think oh. of colors in the abstract so I could say, think of your green as green, your blue as blue, or your red as red, or your, or your chartreuse as chartreuse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we could sort of think of colors as these abstract qualities. And Bradley's thesis is that the, the Romans didn't, they tend, the color words to them were, and their concepts were almost always bound up with material things. Uh-huh. So you... When we think of green, we can just think of green as just a color quality, where if you say the Latin word weiridis, okay, for them it almost means something that is living, right, and fresh and vegetative and green colored. His, his idea, and it's not, it is by no means a, a silly idea, that the word, the category weiridis for the Romans, okay, encompassed not only hue, but living vegetative and growth, okay? And he, he believes from that that the Romans actually did not have, for the most part, these abstract color ideas that we have. And it's a reasonable thing to think, especially if you look at the literary texts, because you know, about the only time you encounter the word weirdness in, in like uh, most of Roman literature, it's referring to a plant. <laughs> I think he's wrong. I think he's mistaken. And I think that's largely due to his data sources. And, and this is from, uh, I've spent a long time reading through all of Pliny's natural history. <laughs> Pliny the Elder has the greatest number of color terms of any author. He's got thousands and thousands of them. And he describes all kinds of natural objects. And from, and from reading Pliny the Elder, I'm totally convinced that the Romans did, in fact, have abstract color concepts, okay? So that the word weirdest is also applied to things that are not alive, like gemstones, emeralds, and yes. um, uh, and, and a number of other kinds of objects, um, uh, various kind of man-made objects that have green color that are obviously not alive or vegetative, which tells me that the Romans did could think abstractly about color when they when they wanted to, but they had a lot less reason to do so. Okay, because the connection between material things and colors in the ancient world was much tighter for them than it is for us. Okay. Um, because they knew, um, for example, like the word luteus comes from the pigment, lutum, right? It starts as a pigment name. It's connected to a certain, that's a certain, a pigment is a certain kind of material. Like the word purpura, right? Or purpureus. That started out as the term for, first of all, the shellfish, from which this the purple dye is obtained, and then from the little bit of juice you get from this little mollusk to make it. So for them, purpura doesn't just mean purple color. It means something that is dyed with this very specific dye from this very specific animal. Okay, and those connections are very tight for them. Well, since you're on since you're on this color, I recall um, reading some time ago a. When I was uh, in the process of doing some research on uh, coloring a, a toga, coloring clothing, and because uh, I was having a having a toga made for me, and so I was talking with this guy, and we were trying to figure out how to how do you duplicate this color, and what color is it exactly? And I recall reading um, that this um, that this color pur- uh, purpureus uh, coming from the what, what's it called a, a murex a murex yes, is yeah, it murex murex uh, that that it could also have um, a particular odor with yeah. it. Do you um, and I, I uh, presumably that odor is not gonna not gonna go away. I mean, except maybe with the exception of time. But do you think there might be it might have also been a connection made between that color term and maybe even the smell, the odor oh, associated? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. It was it was smelly stuff. The dye was um, in and it wouldn't lose its smell at least not immediately. When you know, materials die with it, and in the manu in the manufacturer, you know, just think about crushing up a bunch of shellfish and yeah. letting them rot. How's that going yeah. to smell? <laughs> I think there's a fermentation process. So uh-huh. yeah, so the word uh, the word you know purpura 
mm-hmm. for them. It was ambiguous. It could refer to the murex animal itself. It could refer to the dye that came from it, and it could also refer to things that had been dyed with it. And in, in context, and, and, and things that are going to have that smell. So that word can certainly have material, hue, and odiferous meanings going with it. Okay. Here's the thing, though, is that um, just because a word can have all those meanings right. doesn't mean that every time you use it in context, it has all those meanings. Okay. Okay. So just a caution there to not misuse right. it. Uh-huh. Right. Just, I mean, for example, you know, I, uh, if I say, um, you know, I, I, I bought a new five-string banjo this mm-hmm. week, and I really love playing that instrument. That really makes me happy. I use the word instrument, okay? Were, did you, for example, think of a scalpel when I said that? No, absolutely okay, not. Okay, but yeah. a scalpel, is, that's, uh, that is a medical instrument, is a sense sure. of the word instrument, right? Or did, yeah. or did you think of an assessment instrument that you use at school? No, of course not. Okay. Yeah. So just to demonstrate the idea, the fact that a word like purpura can have all these associations doesn't mean that every time it's used, it brings all those in with mm-hmm. it. Okay. Because sometimes it just means color. Sometimes yes. it can mean, oh, you know, if you want to say, you could probably say to someone in Rome, you're smelling a little bit purpurious today. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> I don't know of any uses of this, but probably possible. Yeah. So. Okay. So what other sorts of um, cautions? M- maybe we could talk about cautions because uh, in, in using these terms, because lately um, uh, with uh, with uh, the recent advent, but well, maybe advent's not the right word, but there's, there's a there's been a big surge, anyways, in, in this um, desire by teachers and and just learners of Latin, period, to want to use now more more oral Latin um, pedagogies and and in doing so um, a lot of uh, a lot of us I, I do it as well we're, we're turning to um, either the modern foreign languages as models or just you know real life experience I mean I have two children who are you know getting ready to turn six and and I think about the way that I was teaching language to them and and certainly uh, colors was one of the first one of the earlier terms or earlier concepts to, to come up, you know, you got to give them these color terms so they can, you know, reach for the right thing, you know? Right. Um, right. Um, so, I mean, with, 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 with so many of the, uh, intricacies that we have, it appears in the, uh, in these Latin, Latin color terms, what should we, uh, what should we do? You see so many of these, um, um, uh, how would you call it? These little pamphlets, these little PDFs where, Ah, here are your colores latini, you yeah, know, right. and boom. But <laughs> what what do we what should what would be the best path to to take there? Do you think? Do you or is there one? To... I don't know. So I mean, what, one of the things I found out is that you know Latin color terms don't really map very well onto English color terms. Okay, so you can say what's the what's the Latin color for pink? And I have to say there isn't one. There is no color category for pink in Latin. Mm. Just isn't there. Um, they would probably just call it some kind of red, you know, um, uh, or roseus or something like that. But so um, it depends on the age of the kids you're talking with, right? So if you're talking about elementary school Latin, just go ahead and take your closest alternative and just, and just teach it to them, you know? So, um, like, let's say like there's no Latin word for orange. You, I mean, I mean, there are, there are, um, there are Latin words that can refer to orange things, but that is orange is not a category for the Romans like uh-huh. it is for us. So for young kids, you know, find something close to it, or just teach them a few colors. You might, you know, um, you know, teach them. I mean, there are basic words for white, black, red, green, and blue. Okay, mm-hmm. works pretty well. Yellow, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a little tough. I mean, you can teach them. You can teach them flowers for yellow, uh, or or luteus or whatever. It's not. Uh-huh. It's not like quite yellow. But when they get older, it's like you know we were talking about high school kids. Th- there's an yes. opportunity there and say, hey, look, cultures are different. Sure. And they um, they they divide these things up in different ways, and and you can say, you you can say to them, you know, if they say, how do you say orange in Latin? You say, well, you can't really. Mm. Yeah. You know, just like how do you say? Well, it, it, it's culturally determined like so uh your oral latin is better than mine so what's the word for a a paternal uncle 
in, uh, isn't it Patros? Yeah, Patros. As opposed to Avunculus. All right. So someone says, what's the word for paternal uncle in English? Uncle. Uncle. <laughs> what's the word for maternal uncle in English? Uncle. Yeah. 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 So you got to say, but so we don't, we don't distinguish those in English, right? Yes, but right. The Romans do. Mm-hmm. So you can just say, well, you know, you can say the Romans, the, you know, we distinguish between red and pink, right? Yeah. That matters to us. The Romans don't. Mm-hmm. So in, in in this case, so we we just sort of reserve uh, reserve the that moment for making these distinctions. Um, you know, when they when they reach a either a higher mm, intellectual capacity, meaning in, in this case, I just merely mean that they're a little bit older sure, um, than right. say middle school kids or so. I mean, don't we um, do this all the time though, and simplify stuff for them and say, well, we'll yeah. worry about that later. <laughs> I, well, you know what? I, I think about the I think about the verb uh, interficere. Um, I mean, there are so many other ways to kill in Latin, but uh, that that just was one that was uh, it appeared most commonly on a, on a list that I had seen, and and I tend to you know with my Latin one kids it's interficere, but then by the time we're you know Latin three, Latin four, and higher, you know then you're using all those other interesting ochidere, necare, and all those other uh, fun verbs which have slightly different. You, you can't really necessarily say syn- that they're synonyms, right? But that they. Uh, but they have nuance, right? And, right, right. And we don't we don't have to give them all the nuance at once. So I would, you know, I would say, you know, I want to be hypercritical of those lists. You know, I, you know, I saw one list, you know, it said for white, it said uh, lacteus. I was like, milky. It's like, sure, why not? <laughs> I don't think people went around describing everything that was white as locked as milky. In the right, right. But you know, it's kind lacteus sum. Right. I am milky. <laughs> I am milky. <laughs> and and so what about um, one of one of the colors uh, I I wanted to ask you about? Well, I guess well we could start with color in English, and then we can sort of open it up as we when we get into Latin. Is this idea of what is what is black or dark, right? Um, because you so you see descriptions of a cave, you know, in Virgil, I think, and I think it was a cave, uh, and he uses uh, the term ater. Um, but then, but then other times you might see, ooh, oh, if you recall um, when Dido's wine, uh, when she was sort of hallucinating there, um, and she saw nigrescere, right? Uh, so like, and it, 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 there's like a piceus, a piceus, pikea, piceus, I think. So how um, how would you? Um, I thought I once understood them, but I don't know that I do at all. Um, what how one might distinguish between those colors or those terms? Um, so uh, uh, and I'm trying to remember. There's um, so if if you for the terms for the black terms and yeah. the white terms and also for the red terms, it's often been said that Latin has. Um, uh, uh, Two, two sets of terms for each one. Okay. And it's commonly said in the dictionaries, for example, so for white, there's albus, okay, mm-hmm. which is just basically, they say flat white or, you know, just sort of plain old white, whereas mm-hmm. candidus is bright white, okay, uh-huh. or, gl- or gleaming white, or yes. somehow sh- like shining or gleaming. Okay. And, uh, and that, and that's, that works out a lot of the time, okay, that is, um, con- you know, candidus actually often does refer to things that are s- like super white or giving up, they're luminescent or they're shiny in some ways, okay? Mm-hmm. Or even for things that are colorless that are light emitting are sometimes called candidus, okay? So things that yeah. are uh, brilliant in that way. They can even be another color, another hue, and you might say they're candidus, and, and that works out for the most part. I'm going to tell you, though, a lot of times... Um, Candidus, at least in the, in the early imperial period, just means white. It, it, that is okay. ordinary white. It doesn't have any of those connotations. So it, that distinction isn't always true. Mm-hmm. Okay. And also for the black terms, ater means uh, very, they say it means very dark, flat, non shiny uh-huh. black, whereas niger uh, means shiny, something that's uh-huh. black and shiny. I think that is generally not true. Okay. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Yeah, there are plenty of times when you see things that are niger that are not shiny, or things that are ater that are shiny. 
Okay, so for the example, they all often uh, talk about uh, is it, it atra sanguis black blood? Right. Okay, blood is shiny when it's coming. But blood out. is shiny, yeah. yeah. So I don't think that distinction necessarily holds up. I, what I yeah. think that is is that ater is the older word. Okay. Okay. And that it, for whatever reasons, um, it it uh, it. Niger becomes becomes the sort of standard un, unmarked word for black, mm. yes. Niger nigra, nigrum, and um, that uh, ater tends to be used uh, with negative emotional connotations, uh-huh. but not always. Okay? okay, but in poetry it tends to be. I mean, they, both of those words can be used for scary or frightening feelings, but ater. More and more in poetry tends to be the word that it has carries a more heavy emotional load of negativity. Okay. Um, uh, some scholars have tried to say this is true for the red terms, where um, where Gruber is sort of the standard red and um, Rutilus. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm, yes. It's sort of you know bright or shiny red, uh-huh. and uh, I think that probably. I, I don't think it work, that works out so well. <laughs> Rutilus is often used of the uh, people who dye their their hair some kind of bright red color, so it's outstanding then. Yes. Um, but um, I'll just say Latin is, you know, ha- has a bunch of synonymous terms for, for red, um, and they they can have various shades of meaning, but um, uh, they're not uh, they're not super significant. Yeah, because I, I was thinking uh, out of those colors that you'd said there, um, uh, what was it in uh, back to back to the Aeneid though, right? When those um, when those awful serpents are headed right towards uh, yeah, w- weren't they described? It was uh, sang- uh, sanguineos. Uh, yeah, sang- it sounds like sanguineos oculos or something like that. Or, so yeah, something like that. Yeah, uh, this sort of blood red, but. Yeah. It, it, I mean, the way that you, uh, the way that the the typical definition that you del- uh, gave for a uh, rutilus seems like that that could have also been a a, a, a satisfactory substitute, and it just makes you wonder why. I mean, I, I suppose we could talk. I guess yeah, we could so I don't, sort I don't, of guess why. They... It would seem kind of weird to me to be like, to put rutilus with the words for eyes, because I think it's usually with um, things that are um, like dyed. I'm, I'm thinking. Ah, okay. Uh, but. Uh, you know, sanguinea in that in that in that passage, you know, sanguinius mm-hmm. tells you not only hue, but these are like bloodshot eyes, right? So these are yeah. referring to actual blood. So there's there's material and color going on at the same time there. Uh-huh. And poets like to use words that have like more meaning, right? Sure, I mean, yeah. You just want to yeah. they want to say, you know, just red eyes, it's like bloody eyes. That's it's better. It gives you color and like yeah. scariness. Yeah, it gives you that uh, that uh, that a bit more of a taste of the spectrum, I suppose, uh, of those uh, of those colors, those little variations and everything, the nuance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, two. Um, does does this have um, do these uh, these color terms and ideas? Do they have any uh, any implications or anything for uh, polychromy? You you know the Romans, right? They much like the Greeks. They're, for instance, they're statues. Yeah, they're buildings also, but they weren't just these white marble pieces of stone, you know, very elegantly and delicately and 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 artistically um, sculpted. They were they were painted, right, and, and they colored, right, and right. Um, and so they're buildings too. And and I wonder if there is um, not something else uh, behind that with, uh, with sort of the culture, I guess, of uh, of culture of terms the culture of the way they understood colors and and then their representation of it in the in the in the physical world so as so as to say they're they're painting their use of these different colors um, statues buildings frescoes and so on i mean i wonder if there's anything more to that or if it's just you know i'm i'm not sure i can connect it specifically to Mm -hmm. language but i think there is kind of an ongoing revolution happening now in the way that people think about the the built environment of both ancient Greece and Rome, and mm. uh, you know there were some famous, uh, there was some, <laughs> there was quite a stir about about c- color and polychromy in the ancient world. Uh, I think it was last summer. 
Yes, yeah. <laughs> when Dr. Sarah Bond at the University That's of right. Iowa, um, was it, was it, uh, what did she, uh, so she, talk, she talked about polychromy and white supremacy. Was it for Aeon, or what was the website that she wrote it for? Uh, I don't recall the website, but yeah, it was something about whitewashing the classics. And, right. Yeah. And what, what she was concerned with there was the fact that you know, in the current political environment, some white supremacists have sort of latched on to these um, images of of white statues, mm-hmm. right from ancient Rome and white you know temples and stuff from ancient yes. Greece and Rome, as being somehow symbolic and connected to their interpretation of Western culture and white supremacy. Uh-huh. And she was at, the gist of her article was that um, that's dumb and it's wrong. And yes. one of the reasons it's dumb is because we now know that this, both the statues and, paint and, and temples were highly colored, okay? The statues yeah. were painted uh, very brightly um, and, uh, and the temples also were decorated and uh, work that, so a lot of really great work in this area has been done by uh, mm. Uh, Vincenzo Brinkman, I hope I'm saying his, his name right, uh, and, and in the United States, Mark Abbe, who have been studying you know this. Uh, Dr. Bond's point was, we need to teach our students that ancient, ancient art was highly colored, and to, you know, to separate our conceptions of ancient Greek and Roman, uh, ancient Greek and Roman culture from modern white, suprem- white supremacy, which I think is, is true. But it yes. is. But I, when I talk to my students, um, I just ask my Greek Civ class, 110 students. I said, when you, mm-hmm. when you think of ancient Greece, when you think about their art and ec- architecture, what do you think? And they, what color do you think of? And they say white. And so when I when I show show them this work that has been done, they're usually quite shocked. Um, mm. Is there any connection to race in that? So I so I asked them this question. I said, so do you think of the ancient Greeks? as being white or some other race. Mm-hmm. And they said white. And I said, okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. Then I said, okay, how about the people who are living in south, um, southwestern Anatolia, in, in, in Turkey, modern Turkey? Mm. She yeah. said, I said, do you think of them as being white or some other race? And they said, no, they're not white. They're some other race. Ah. And I said, well, genetically speaking, they're the same people. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, they're the same. Okay, they're yeah. they're not genetically distinct. I said, so why do you think of Turks as being not white, and why do you think of Greeks as being white? And some, yeah. some of them said, because of the statues. Oh man, there it is. The proof is in the pudding. Yeah, so I think Dr. Bond has a has a point. Any, yes. Uh, um, but I, I, your listeners, if they haven't done it yet, they should Google up or use some other uh, non-monopolistic search engine <laughs> 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 to find yeah. the gods in color. Display the website. Have you seen it, Jesse? Uh, no, the Gods in Color. Yeah, it's I don't think gods so. Gods in Color. Yeah. So the uh, Brinkman and some other and a bunch of other good scholars have by studying the pigment, fra- the little remains of pigments that have been found on ancient statues, sort of recreating, you know, uh, the the colors on those statues. And and it was a traveling museum show. It's no, I think it's I don't think it's on the road anymore. But they mm-hmm. they showed, you know. The, the colored reproductions along with reproductions of uncolored ones so that people see the difference between what they probably actually look like and uh, what we think. Oh, about. are you referring to um, some of those, uh, like the archer? Yes, um, the Trojan archer with his, with his, his, his great, um, those are better than any Lululemon y- yoga pants you'll ever find. For oh my gosh. <laughs> those, those, <laughs> those triangles, you know, it's yes, really great. Um, you tights. know, I think I had a pair of pants similar to that in the 80s. Yeah. Um, I think that's a possibility. Yeah, uh, I had a pair of striped pants like that in middle school in 1972, oh man. <laughs> <It's> styling. <laughs> Profiling. Yeah, that, you know, the uh, that polychromy um, is, uh, is uh, of course, besides the, uh, I mean, the, the, the all-important um, race implications, which, as you just pointed out, and, of course, Dr. Bond was arguing, too, um, um, that's something that I, uh, in in my own work uh, with uh, with these little uh, recreations of of buildings and stuff that I that I do, uh, try to try to point out to them uh, to to any to viewers just anyone that the reality is is that these were these are colorful p- 
people, colorful um, statues and buildings and things, and 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 so that there is. Although I'd never give a, get a chance to go into you know some of the thoughts behind uh, what that might, some of the cultural implications that might have. Um, it's still it's just it's just a way to sort of put that out there and just. First of all, know that they were very colorful and that that was an, uh, an important part of their of their culture. And then, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully from that point on, teachers can then that'll maybe open the door for conversations to be had in class. Like, you know, I, I saw in that Magister Crab video, um, you know, the uh, why did the building, why did the, why did those columns, you know, have the have the red stripe around the bottom or the or the or the gold? And, you know, they can kind of hopefully open up uh, something, which is what I'm trying to do. Uh, the kind of the point of this conversation with you too. Can I add a little something with, to what I said before as well? Yeah, yeah I said yeah. so. I don't want. I, I, um, I liked. I liked what Dr. Bond wrote. I will say there are lots of motivations for people, um, like uh, people uh, liking the white statues, and they're not. They're not all racist. Okay, that is. Yeah. Um, um, one thing people are used to seeing them that way, and. Mm. Um, and actually, in the Renaissance, you know, someone like uh, Michelangelo, had a, uh, you know, who did some great sculptures. He did not paint his sculpture. He had trouble, you know, believing that the Greek, the, the Greeks would have, uh, and the Romans would have colored their sculptures. And even, you know, the sculptor Rodin, okay, the mm-hmm. French sculptor in the 19th century. By then, archaeologists had started to figure out that ancient sculpture was painted. There enough that had been found. They found it. You know, Rodin says, "I just can't believe." They would have painted it, though, so they just didn't like it. And so um, a lot of the sort of Renaissance and neoclassical ideals were just an aesthetic ideal. They, and there's nothing wrong with liking just white marble statues. It doesn't mean you're a racist, and I don't want to accuse anyone of, of, you know, of being a racist for simply liking Oh, them, no, like yeah. <laughs> it also has to do with the rise of modernism in architecture, you know, which, you know, which doesn't like decoration. If you look at modern, you know, modern buildings, they tend to be... Undecorated and uncolored, and that's that is a perfectly fine aesthetic. Okay, yes, um, but that is that wasn't the ancient aesthetic, right? right. Yeah, I was. Uh, well, when you talk about these sort of this uh, Renaissance and um, Renaissance art, I, I think of the um, what's that? That that Bernini statue, uh, the the rape of uh, the Rato di Proserpina, the rape of Persephone. Right. And, I, I, you just think about that, that. You always see that image sort of floating around, where his hand is kind of, uh, kind of grab, uh, grasping uh, very tightly her uh, her thigh there, her upper thigh. And, and, the, and, and uh. I don't know that if that were in color, if that would have the same you know effect on on viewers as it does when you see just the pure um, white polished marble, you know. Yeah, you may have you may have lost some of that. So. And, you know, I think Bernini was not thinking in terms of having his sculpture colored in any way, but it's right. pretty clear that the ancient sculptors were okay. They were planning to have th- things painted, and um, I can't remember whether it's Praxiteles or one of the other sculptors. Um, there's um, I should have this quotation at hand, but basically. Um, Thought that the ancients thought that sculpture sculpture came to life when when it was decorated with color, and they would have seen unpainted sculpture as being sort of lifeless. Now, mm. I mean, I'm a big f- fan of Bernini, although that um, I'm <laughs> people who say those sculptures are pretty rapey have a, a point. It actually does de- depict a rape, right? And, right. Uh, yes. And also his his Apollo and Daphne has kind of got the same effects there in terms yeah. of yeah. But in terms of the technique of sculpture, it's amazing, yes. and I, it, it wasn't made to be colored, and, you know, I wouldn't want to see it painted. Right, yeah, yeah, yes. But uh, I think you did well to sort of caution that, that uh, appreciating appreciating a marble statue doesn't, uh, for, you know, appreciating it in its, how do we say this, it's crude, nah, well, not crude, but it's, it's, it's simple marble form does not necessarily <laughs> make you a racist. No. Um, we should be, uh, should be clear about that. <laughs> I don't want a Twitter mob after me. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, these guys. <laughs> You're the last thing we need. Oh, man. Well, um, yeah, so I, I guess, David, I um, in terms of uh, colors, uh, I think I've, uh, I don't know, maybe I've exhausted sort of my uh, my questions for you. Uh, if, if there were anything else that you wanted to maybe add or another point that we should um, should discuss, let's, think, uh, let's entertain it. I think we covered it. Okay. I think we covered it. Well, um. 
Now, much appreciate uh, your time and, and you um, sharing this uh, most important uh, you know, insight information with us. Uh. Just, I, I just want to plug the fact that I have a book coming out on this. Yeah. Uh, it's from, going to be coming out uh, in the next year or two from Bloomsbury, it's, um, a Cultural History of Color and Antiquity. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm editing that, and I co-wrote uh, a chapter, and, the, and I wrote the introduction. So um, there's some really fantastic scholars that are doing um, things on philosophy, psychology, language, sculpture, um, artifacts. Um, so uh, I'm really pleased with the contributions that we have so far. I'm also um, hoping to get research leave to do to, to finish the book on color semantics, just just the uh, just the language side of that. Oh, I hope that comes out in the next couple of years. Yeah, and and you know if um, if you like what we could, uh, what I'll do too is uh, maybe I'll put together just like a, a brief little um, sort of bibliography, of some of your own work published or forthcoming, and then maybe if there's anyone else that um, I think remember like the, uh, who's at the Gods in Color and oh, so many other people like it. There's so much work going on right now; it's really fantastic. Yeah, maybe I'll put a little bit together just to give listeners a a, a taste of uh, of some of the things that um, that you uh, touched on tonight. Uh, in our little talk here. Um, well, in that case, uh, David, again, I thank you uh, very much for uh, taking the time to come and have this uh, wonderful chat with me. Thanks for having me on, Magister. All right. All right. Well, best of uh, best of luck on your uh, on finishing your research there, and we look forward to uh, reading it soon. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Wale. Wale. Wale.